Hello everyone, my name is Patrick Biggs and today I'm going to give a short talk on a longitudinal study of Compilobacter within a New Zealand broiler farm. However, before I do that, I would just like to thank the organisers for allowing me to speak today at this event in memory of Ali Cody. Compilobacter is a notified disease in New Zealand and as can be seen from the slide here, over a 20 year period Monitoring has shown a gradual rise up until about 2006 and then a decline subsequently. This decline has been due to interventions that the poultry industry put in place in around 2007 and such interventions are thought to have saved the New Zealand economy somewhere between 50 to 70 million dollars a year. We can see a seasonal pattern here, mostly around summertime, but in addition, on the far right hand side, we can see another peak outside of this pattern that was due to the large waterborne outbreak of Compilobacter that occurred in August 2016. Chicken is a source for Compilobacter in New Zealand. Human cases attributed to poultry showed an internationally rare sequence type ST474 was predominating. This was generally the case until about 2014 when our group MepiLab started noticing a new sequence type ST6964 from our routine surveillance in the Manawatu Sentinel site that was set up by our group including Nigel French of course. So until 2015 AMR levels in New Zealand chicken was very low. This was reflected by similar low levels in humans and also low level antibiotic use in the New Zealand poultry industry. So for example, fluoroquinolones have never been used and tetracyclines are very rarely used, but never in meat chicken flocks. So ST6964 showed resistance to both tetracyclines and fluoroquinolones. So this resulted in a sharp increase in AMR and also 6964 in human cases around New Zealand. It should also be pointed out that eventually SD6964 was detected in all four main New Zealand poultry companies. A New Zealand Food Safety Science and Research Centre project was funded with the Poultry Association to look at the control of Compilobacter within the poultry industry. So the project goal here was to enable the poultry industry to develop on-farm risk management practices to prevent Compilobacter contamination in broiler flocks. This project started in 2019 and consisted of two phases. The first phase was identifying the most robust and informative sample types, sampling sites and testing methods for Compilobacter detection from a broiler farm environment. Phase two was then a farm-based pilot longitudinal single flock study by means of a microbiological survey, focusing of course on Compilobacter. So information generated through phase one subsequently informed phase two. So the objective was to investigate of the potential pre-processing sources of Compilobacter in broilers by sampling multiple environmental and shed-based potential sources and vectors. In this slide here, you can see the farm shed layout. So a single farm was chosen from one poultry supplier in the North Island of New Zealand. Two sheds were used with the focus being on one shed. So the sampling window here covered a 12 week period and this covered the time from the end of one flock through the, through the cleaning process of the shed and then the full six weeks and a little bit beyond the housing of a new broiler, broiler flock in that shed. As I said, a variety of sampling locations were chosen, um, including from the shed, the environment, the birds, and also the humans working there. So samples were collected in late 2019. They were collected again from a variety of locations, for example, fly, insect, and rodent traps, as well as using things like tarpauling and paper to collect wild bird feces. And these were placed around the shed for 48 hours prior to sample collection. We then set up a system with the master ID linking all collected sample information and this was provided for both enrichment aliquots and isolates along with whether enrichments were pre or post incubation or if it was a 
genetic isolate. So on the right hand side here you can see the results of the Molditoff speciation of isolates that were collected during the study. So this ranges in time over a couple of months from the end of October to the middle of December 2019 and it only shows the rows for which uh, Compilobacter samples were Molditoffed. So at the beginning here we can see eight uh, Compilobacter lauri. This was the only time these were recorded. And you can also see that the vast majority of species recorded were Compilobacter jejuni, but there were quite a few Compilobacter coli. So whilst we detected three species via the Molditoff, we only chose to work on C. jejuni isolates for whole genome sequencing. 201 isolates were taken from 165 samples and whole genome sequenced and then analysed with a full Nullarbor 2 pipeline. This data was analysed in a variety of different data sets and I'm not going to go into those in great in any detail at all. Suffice to say that an iterative process was performed and for example one well-known reference genome was used to analyse all samples against it to start off with and then that was nuanced to use different references for smaller data sets. So on the right hand side here you can see the sequence type and the counts we saw from the 201 isolates and you can also see that we have a domination here by ST6964 accounting for over 50% of the samples but in addition we have large numbers of samples from ST50 and ST45. We also have um, a new sequence type in the table that actually turned out to be a variant of ST3663. So this slide shows a summary of the genomes of the 201 isolates by using a number of different metrics. I think the key thing to notice in this slide really is shown in panels C and D. In panel C we can see that the ST45 and ST50 sequence types are generally of a smaller genome size and that ST6964 is generally of a much larger genome size and this of course is primarily due to the integrated elements found within the ST6964 genome. In the panel on the right hand side we have the number of coding genes that are predicted of these contigs and we can again see that ST6964 has a large number of, of genes and ST45 and 50 have fewer genes. The SNP dendrogram on the right hand side in this figure shows rings indicating in the centre sequence type and on the outer ring source. So we can see on the left hand side the large mass of 6964 which is looking very clonal and on the right hand side we have ST50 in the cyan colour and then ST45. So what's interesting to note about this slide is a couple of points. First of all, all these 6964 isolates come from within the chicken environment. There are no wildlife sources for 6964. There are wildlife sources for both the new 3663 variant and also one of the subgroups we found within ST45 in orange. There is also another subgroup of ST45 which was related to the catcher equipment and also the isolates within ST50 were also related to the catcher equipment. So as I said in the previous slide, there are some groups within some of the sequence types. This is shown very nicely in this minimum spanning tree. It's dominated in the middle there by ST6964 in dark blue, but on the left hand side you can see these two uh, different groups of ST45 and on the right hand side different groups of ST50. Nullarbor 2 also produces a resistome as part of its output. So what I've done in this slide here is taken the results from that analysis and, and looked at it further by looking at functional sequence changes within genes of interest. So here I have shown the results for three genes, TET-O, Gyra-A and Tra-C, against the sequence types we found. So for TET-O, this was present in all ST6964 as 
as an allele and it was found in only one of the ST50 isolates. The situation in gyro A is a little bit more complicated. We have eight alleles, but the most noticeable point here is that the 6964 isolates all showed one allele and that encoded the well-known T86I functional mutation which will confer antibiotic resistance. In addition, we found different alleles in ST45 and ST50. Finally, the TRAR-C gene, which is associated with the plasmid in ST6964, show two alleles. One allele was found in nearly all our ST6964s, and again, an example in an ST50. And a second allele was found in our new ST3663 variant that was different to the one in 6964. We can also analyze our data spatially. So to do this, the microreact site was used. And what I've got here is a screenshot of such an output showing the farm shed that I've shown before, and also a tree on the right hand side here of how the sequences relate. And then finally at the bottom information about those sequences. So what I have shown in this first example is the lineage of ST50 associated with the catching crews when the birds were 29 or 30 days old and also when they were taken at the final cut at day 41. So this is a lineage that was not seen in the previous flock. In contrast, however, if we look at the situation for ST6964 with the Trasi plasmid, we can see that the previous flock now shows that the sequences detected had a strong similarities with the isolates that are found in the subsequent plot. So that's indicated by the fact that we have circles on the right hand side here in different parts of the tree. So in summary, a longitudinal study has been conducted with the aim of contributing to the development of on-farm risk management practices that reduce contamination of broiler flocks with Compilobacter. A New Zealand broiler farm was chosen and samples were collected from a large broiler shed during a 12-week period from the end of one flock and the housing of a second flock. Of 401 isolates that were generated, analysis by Moldytoff found that the vast majority of them were C. jejuni, but also we found C. coli and C. lari. Having said that, C. jejuni was the only Compilobacter species detected in the broiler flock itself. 201 isolates underwent whole genome sequencing and were analysed using Nullable 2, with the main sequence types detected being ST6964, ST50 and ST45. Two clades within ST45 were found, and the ST6964 isolates all carried a Teto gene with the T. 86R mutation in gyro A that causes resistance. There was carryover of AMR containing ST6964 from the previous flock into the second flock. ST45 was found only in wildlife samples and on the catching crews but not in or on the poultry samples. So this study has shown that evidence of carryover of strains has led to a refocus on cleaning of sheds between flocks. Integration with ongoing metagenomic analysis, which I have not described today, will allow a richer spatiotemporal analysis of the chicken shed environment and inform future management practices. And then finally, new projects with the New Zealand poultry industry are ongoing and we are looking at other aspects of compiler back to control within the industry. This project has been the result of the work of many people, including all my colleagues at uh, Mepi Lab at Palmerston North in Massey University, our colleagues at ESR, and of course, the members of the uh, Poultry Industry Association of New Zealand and the Broiler Farm who helped with this study, notably Kerry McQueen, Roy Biggs, Murray Callender, and Michael Brooks. And then finally, I'd just like to uh, just give a sign of the scale of the New Zealand uh, Food Safety Science and Research Centre. Here you can see the industry members 
as well as the government agencies that fund it and the research providers from universities and the New Zealand Crown Research Institutes involved. Thank you very much.